Hey everyone, this is Rock from StageInTheSky.com and we need to talk about this documentary that came out called The Secrets of Hillsong that's on Hulu and is co-produced by Vanity Fair looks like and I usually don't do stuff like this but I've never heard of Hillsong. I heard of the music but I never heard of the actual church, right? Um, so I really came into to this with an open mind and I had no hard prejudices about prosperity preaching or even the concept of megachurch though I've heard other people complain. I personally never really had like, man I hate them, you know, <laughs> you know, I never had that. So as I went into watching this, I had questions in mind like what is Hillsong? What happened? And may, more importantly, why do so many in the mainstream see to care, right? When I say mainstream, I'm talking about pop culture, right? Because usually pop culture stays, or they, they're the ones who say, hey, there's no place for religion in blank, or keep, you know, your Christianity away from me. That's kind of usually how they, they work. But with Hillsong, it's so interweaved for some reason. I wanted to understand that. And the reason why I'm doing this video is because there are a lot of people, like the people that conducted the interviews and the producers, you got the sense that they really, they were critical of Hillsong, but also they were critical of Christianity itself. Like a lot of the parishioners who gave interviews, they said a lot of outlandish things. Like they criticized the church and it got me asking, like, why do you guys go to church? Right? Like, what do you, what do you think the purpose of Christianity or Christ dying for us? What, what do you think that purpose was? All right. So let, let's talk about, let's get into it because man, yeah, I'm going to say a lot of stuff. First off, I want to make it clear for those who may not be very like if you're not super christian if you don't know the bible if you're in, if you're a christian and you're in the middle of your christian journey i encourage you guys to take this with um a grain of salt because i'm going to say a lot of things a lot of biblical truths that you probably haven't heard because so many people are afraid of hurting your feelings right um a lot of the truth that's in the bible goes against what the world's teaching so if this is the first time you hear and i'm going to use scriptures like i'm going to put scriptures on the screen so if you if it's the first time you heard it or you're you're angry and upset by what i'm about to say i'm just talking the word of god it's on the screen and i encourage you guys to pray ask for understanding ask for guidance um, ask that God soften your heart because if again if this is the first time you ever heard any of this It's going to go against the grain of how you've been living your life That's not easy, right? If you were taught a certain way your whole life and then all of a sudden someone tells you something different You're gonna be a little bit frustrated. There's gonna be some friction there's some pushback and that's understandable And don't take my word for it all I'm about to say other than the scriptures themselves it's just my opinion based on, if you don't know who I am, my name is Rock I read the Bible the entire Bible, you know from cover to cover twice now i'm in the middle of a third reading i've read other books from dennis prager just to in depth so i just have like i've never been to a theocratic school so i'm not someone who's super you know into all these semantics and all these special you know terms or whatever like the catholicism and catechisms i'm not into all that i'm just into what does the bible say you know that's all i care about you know everything else is just hearsay or interpretations and you can go to that but here i'm just going to go straight from what the bible says all right so this is going to hit on hypocrites because you guys we've all heard this right ever since we were little oh you're a hypocrite oh well if you're a hypocrite you you know you need to practice what you preach okay okay i get it i get it food for thought if a person preaches the word of god and they rely on the bible for their messaging meaning if they're up at the pulpit if they're on the stage and they're talking about the word of god but they turn out to be hypocrites not living by the standards by which they preach does that mean that they're wrong about what they preach let me repeat that if a person's preaching the word of God and they're relying on the Bible, they're just telling you what the Bible says, but it turns out they're not living by what the Bible says, does that mean that the Bible's wrong? According to the documentary, most of Hillsong's mainstream appeal, especially to a younger audience and a secular society that's moving away from the Bible, was due to a charismatic, good-looking speaker named Carl Lentz. I've never heard of this guy before this video, um, so I was introduced to him just the same as anyone else if you're, this is the first time you heard of him. Um, as a face of Hillsong, Carl Lentz had a magnetic gift for oratory, meaning he's a good speaker. His popularity blossomed due to association with celebrities like Justin Bieber, you see picture here, of Oprah Winfrey, you see Drake, you know, so it helped him to really bridge into getting celebrities and basically, I think, I would say, strengthening celebrities to embrace their Christianity, especially in Hollywood. However, as is the case with many spiritual leaders, Carl was ensnared by the weaknesses of the flesh and he gave in to sexual temptation. He cheated on his wife with some random woman and even had an affair with his nanny. This is terrible. This is awful. I don't want to downplay it. I'm not going to gloss over it. This is horrible. And God knows how much I personally hate adultery so much because I know how people should be grateful to have a loving spouse to begin with. Some of us don't have that luxury. 
This reminds me of another spiritual leader who also struggled with sexual sin, the late Ravi Zacharias. After he passed away, it came out that he engaged in extramarital affairs. Ravi Zacharias' influence and notoriety as one of the world's foremost Christian apologetics was huge. After the scandal broke, I saw people using his mistakes as an opportunity to discredit everything he's ever done and talked about. I'm not entirely sure if I'm on board with that. I don't agree with this notion that if someone's proven to be a hypocrite, then everything they've ever said and preached is wrong. King David is one of the most zealous and prolific writers alive. He wrote over 70 psalms, but sinned when he had Uriah killed after sleeping with Uriah's wife. Does that mean that King David was wrong about everything he preached? Consider King Solomon. King Solomon was said to be one of the richest, wisest men alive. He wrote most of the Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and the Song of Solomon, but ended up taking over 700 concubines, some of whom led him to worshiping false gods. Does this mean that Solomon was wrong about everything he ever preached? Ladies and gentlemen, everyone falls short. Other than Jesus Christ, there isn't a single person alive who hasn't stumbled spectacularly and caved into some horrible sin or, or, or vice. I get it. I get it. Being a spiritual leader brings with it a higher standard that one must live by. The same way you expect officers of the law to be held to a higher standard than a layman. But several things call me to question the motives of those who are so quick to discredit these people. 1. If you took personal responsibility to read the Bible for yourself, then you know the truth. What doctrines are made up, and which are just the individual's interpretation of the scriptures. And 2. I suspect that those who are so quick to discredit those spiritual leaders, they were never believers in the first place. They were waiting for an opportunity, excuse, to reject the scriptures to justify their rebellion or lack of interest. They're using that as an excuse to justify them not wanting to do it, you know, not wanting to draw close to God or read the Bible in the first place. Don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to be dismissive of the deep, painful feelings of betrayal, the destruction of trust that you place in another to help you draw close to God. I got that sense from watching this documentary, right? If you put so much faith and a spiritual leader because you're looking for guidance you and you struggle to understand the Bible yourself and that person leads you astray yeah that's not that's not cool you know like that's very it's, it's a deep betrayal you know because this is your soul that you're messing with you know I would say that God knows your heart and he would probably take that in consideration when it comes to judging you but he's the ultimate judge so I get it there is a betrayal there if you're just starting out and you never had that guidance your spiritual leader can do a lot of damage manipulating you to do things that God never approved condoned or wanted for you even in TV shows it seems to be a common trope of historical fiction to have some over-the-top corrupt priest or clergyman who abuses the trust others place in him to manipulate the masses the king or whoever right it's kind of getting I'm starting to roll my eyes when I see it you know I just saw the last kingdom like the movie and i'm like of course there's going to be a clergyman who's using god to manipulate the king saying oh god wants you to do this god wants you to destroy this village yep that's what they're going to do but as upset as i am with those who use religion as a tool to serve their own means here now in 2023 where we have the bible free for consumption print or online how long are people going to continue using the excuse of i was lied to i was misled when you have the truth available to you free of charge what do i mean rock well back in I would say Noah's time, or even Martin Luther's time. People didn't have the Bible. They, they relied on the priests and the clergymen who went to sc the schools and colleges to basically learn what the Bible says, to learn what the truth of the gospels, right? But us here, 2023, it's readily, it's the most published book ever. Though I think 50 Shades of Grey is coming up, which is, speaks volumes to how far we decline. Anyways, if you don't read the Bible for yourself, you are vulnerable to being misled and twisted by false teachers. That being said, I'm not convinced that Ravi Zacharias or Carl Lentz are false teachers. Not from what was presented, not unless there was something else that was left out, right? What I saw in Carl was a man who just struggled with the same vice every hot-blooded man throughout all of human history have struggled with. Even in the book of Numbers, this is Numbers chapter 25, Israel's enemies knew that using sex and immoral women to corrupt the nation would turn them away from God, and it did. That worked, right? So when people say, oh, are men so easily weak that all it takes is a good pair of tits to distract them? Or, why can't my daughter go to school dress however she wants? It's not her fault that the guys are so easily distracted. These people are either lying, oblivious, or stupid. And by stupid, I don't mean that as an insult. I mean you lack the ability to comprehend. Our desire, I'm talking about men, our desire as men for affection, to love and be loved by women have always been our greatest weakness. This isn't to blame women. The responsibility is on all, us as men to say no. Remember what Jesus Christ said? If your eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out. Another way to pluck it out is just to simply get up and walk out of the room. Remove yourself from that situation, that temptation. 
right? That's me putting accountability on Carl Lentz. I know that's easier said than done, especially if, for people who one, are rarely faced with temptation, so you're not practiced. Two, people who are constantly dealing with temptation because everyone's throwing themselves at you. And three, people who are like me who want to get married, but we see how backward our society has become where sex needs to be a prerequisite to marriage. Meaning people like me don't engage in a hookup culture, though we want to get married. So it's tough because we find a beautiful woman in the gym or whatever, we want to get to know her, but she engages in a hookup culture. I encourage everyone to resist. I have an essay down below where I'm encouraging all my Christian brothers and sisters to resist the sexual temptation. Seek first the kingdom of heaven and all things be added unto you. That's in Matthew chapter 6 verse 33. All that said, I can't overlook the fact that Carl Lentz did what he could to save as many as he could, right? Either way, he stumbled. He deserved to be fired. He deserved to have his flock taken from him. But that doesn't mean his teachings were all bad or that he didn't save thousands by at least directing them to Christ. Whenever someone falls for grace, you see this image that I have up? Whenever someone falls for grace, I suspect that a lot of people have the mentality of this picture right here. I say that because I understand. I may be a Christian now, but I haven't forgotten how wicked I used to be. It is a very satanic thing to hope for and be glad that someone has turned out to be a hypocrite. But it's not just hypocrites that people want to see fall, right? Pretty much anyone who appears to have the wholesome Christian lifestyle. I, I hate to use the Duggar family because there's so much controversy and unknown out there, but I sensed it. Back when um, the 19 Kids in County, back when their heyday in TLC, I had to watch a few of those episodes for my job, and this family t appeared to be a good, wholesome, decent family, right? They were complete opposite of the Kardashians. So when I saw the controversy that they were hit with, and you know, they were constantly, you know, I, I, you could tell people they wanted to see them fall because this was a good family They touted themselves as a good Christian family and people don't like that Remember Jesus's words at John chapter 15 verse 19 if you are of the world the world will love you as its own But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world Therefore the world hates you Ladies and gentlemen, if you call yourself a Christian and you live by Christian lifestyles You're going to be at odds with the world when I say the world. I'm talking about mainstream culture It's pride month right now, right? People are going to look down on you. Hold on. What did you say about pride? You know, that's that's the world. But you have to choose. That's what it means to be a Christian. It's a voluntary thing. The world doesn't want to see Christians succeed because it shines light on their own sinful lifestyles. It's the reason why a lot of people claim they want a good man or woman, but they actually go for the bad boys and amoral ladies because being with someone who has a life together with no drama and conflicts and doing the right thing, it puts pressure on you to be a better person. Bad boys and bad girls are easy, right? So, and that's another essay, all right? Let's get into the progressivism of the church. When I say progressivism, I may be butchering that, but what I saw in this S in this documentary, The Hillsong, The Secrets of Hillsong, was a lot of complaints. It wasn't about Christianity so much as it was about people wanting Christianity to be progressive. I don't like that. I don't respect that. I, I can't stand it. Let's get into it. As I watched the first two episodes of the documentary, I'm of the opinion that the producers were trying to condemn Hillsong for things like its stance on gay marriage or its lack of diversity and inclusion. There were parts of the documentary where people voiced their concerns about how the stage was full of conservative white men. They wanted more diversity than just the diversity of their audience. Because and I say diversity of the audience because a lot of the audience was black, white. It was a group. It was a congregation. Congregation is multiple races, right? But they wanted representation on stage. I ask, why? So you're trying to tell me you wouldn't mind seeing nothing but white men leading the sermons while there's no black people preaching at all, Rock? Well, I have to ask, why are you there? Why do you go to church? Is it to see representation? To find people who look like you on the stage? Is that why you came? Well, I came to worship and learn the word of God, all right? But I wouldn't mind seeing some people who look like me up on the stage. Why? Ask yourself, why is that so important to you? I don't say that to slight you, but to help you understand. Well, isn't it important to you? Maybe if you learn why it's not important to you, you might understand yourself. Okay, okay, <laughs> okay. The reason why it's not important to me is because Christianity isn't about race. It doesn't matter to me who's preaching the gospels because if they're sticking to the scriptures, I know the word doesn't come from man, it comes from God. God doesn't have a color. He doesn't have an ethnicity. He doesn't have a culture other than what's in the Bible, right? That's Christianity. Christianity is not about having your culture represented. It's not about celebrating your sexuality, your race, or the triumphs of, of your ethnic group. Being a Christian means being a follower of Christ. That's all it means. Christ came to serve all humanity, not just black lives. There's a jab at black lives because they talk about that heavily. And I'm like, I couldn't believe it, man. Let me keep going. At Matthew chapter 12, verse 46 through 50, people came to Jesus Christ and they were like, hey, your brother and sisters are at the gate. And Jesus Christ said this, 
Who is my mother? And who are my brothers? And stretching out his hand toward his disciples, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my, is my brother and sister and mother. Ladies and gentlemen, he said, Whoever does the will of my Father is my brother and sister. Whoever. It doesn't matter what your skin color is. Christianity is the only culture that matters because it encompasses everyone who chooses to live by God's commandments. There's your diversity and inclusion. Everyone who chooses to live by God's commandments. Not to mention, if we really wanted to see black preachers on stage, come on. It'd be simple, right? I'm a, I'm a black guy talking in here. I grew up in the South. There's thousands of black churches all across America, right? So who? The, so the question I want to ask these people is like, who do I think I am that I should go to a new church, look around, and then demand that they change to appease me? The thing is, Carl Lentz actually did support Black Lives Matter. I didn't like that he did it, but he did it. You know, he did it in some of his speeches. He did it in interviews. He chanted the slogan. And just like the mainstream, he criticized those who dare to say all lives matter. But that was enough for his progressive audience. Was it? In episode one, it was revealed that there was this big meeting during the heightened ten racial tensions of the 2010s. Like, we think uh, Trayvon Martin, George Floyd, and all that. You know, where Carl Lentz and others heard from the diverse prisoners. By diverse, I'm talking about people of color. Which is really, really slim way of saying colored people. It's just so sad how backwards we were going, right? Black people, you know? Carl's initial argument was, I believe this should be organic, not intentional when it comes to his message and, you know, having diversity and inclusion. But after being pressured by people, he switched to say, I will try and make things more intentional. By intentional, I take it that mean exactly what we're seeing in Hollywood and the publishing industry, where characters and stories are not created and promoted by what makes sense in terms of reality, meaning what you actually find in the real world, but to intentionally cater to the fantasies of the vocal minority and how they want the world to be. I don't respect that. And that's kind of my main issue with the prisoners. When I say prisoners, I'm talking about churchgoers and former churchgoers, the ones who were giving these interviews in this documentary, right? That was a lot of my issues with it. Because like, at 44 minutes into part two of the documentary, a woman legit says, whether it's LGBTQ issues or Black Lives Matter, Christianity has always been a step behind. This is what she says. She says this with a straight face. Let me repeat that. She says, whether it's LGBTQ issues or Black Lives Matter, Christianity has always been a step behind. Another black woman, I had to use her race because she's talking about Black Lives Matter. Another black woman at 46 minutes in says that while black people are being killed like George Floyd, Carl Lentz gets all this acclaim because nobody is saying anything, just because Christianity is so backwards. And I'm sitting here watching these, they're saying this with a straight fit. These are supposed to be people who went to the church, right? And again, you ask yourself, why are you going to church? Is it not to be a better Christian, to be a follower of Christ? But this is what they're saying. They're saying things like, Christianity is so backwards. Christianity is always a step behind. I couldn't believe it. I mean, they act like they have greater authority than Christ himself, as if the Bible needs to change to get with the times. It is wicked. Ladies and gentlemen, when I say wicked, I'm talking about anything that tells you the opposite of what Bible tells you. That's wicked, okay? So when I say it is a wicked thing, it is a wicked thing to demand that Christianity change to please our modern sensibilities, because it's not supposed to change. Ladies and gentlemen, we are the ones who are supposed to change. We are the ones who are supposed to conform to Christ's teachings, not have Christ's teachings conform to us. Again, you have to ask, who do these people think they are? That's why I asked earlier when I said, why is it so important to you? The reason why I think it's so important because you're raised with a mentality that you are entitled to have the world cater and bend over backwards for you just because of either the way you were born, you, the, your level of oppression, whatever you think you face, you think that the world owes you something. You don't. You don't, ladies and gentlemen. I say that with love because it's the truth. All right? It reminds me of what God said to Job in Job chapter 38, starting in verse 4. He said, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? This is what God said to Job because Job was asking questions. Oh, I'm suffering and I had all these things taken from me. You know, so he's put all these questions to God and God re responds in chapter 38. He says, where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? The point of those scriptures, if you read the rest of chapter 38, is to let the reader let you know that you, while you are loved, God knows you exist and he wants you to be saved. You need to humble yourself. You have no authority. You should bear no entitlement. You should make no demands of the living God who created all things. Barack, they weren't making demands of God. Their complaint was with the church. The lady said, Christianity is always a step behind. She was talking about Christianity. So spare me. Even if she meant the church is always a step behind. If she knew what the Bible said and humbled herself to what God says on the matter, like homosexuality, those words would not have come from her lips. 
Another issue that came up in the documentary was this issue about having women preachers, having female preachers stand up at the pulpit and lead on the lead the congregation on sun, on Sunday service, right? Because one woman, uh, she talked about her aspirations of becoming a pastor, and she essentially conveyed that it's discrimination to not let women do that, to not let women preach. Another woman commented that every time a woman was on stage, it was in a supportive role for either her husband or some other guy, and she said this as if it was a bad or shameful thing. The reason why I, I'm hammering this point home and I talk about humbling yourself, the reason why they have this attitude about the church is because they don't know the Bible. They don't know what the Bible says about the roles of men and women. I'm sorry if it seems like picking on the ladies here, but it really is out of love that I say these things. When I say love, I'm talking about open reproach is better than your love that you keep to yourself and you just let people go on, leading to a path of destruction. Ladies, you can't serve both God and the world. You have to pick one. Feminism has done a lot of great things, right? I'm all for women having the same legal rights as men. You should have the same right to vote as men. I agree with that. But God has outlined and instructed roles of men and women in the Bible. You have to choose whether or not you want to accept God's word on the matter. I have a link down below that basically breaks down, you know, whether women can be pastors and they write it 10 times better than I could. But suffice to say at 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 11 through 15, the apostle Paul writes, let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over men, rather she is to remain quiet. For Adam was formed first, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. Yet she will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith and love and holiness with self-control. I know, if you were raised in our modern American culture for the past couple of decades, these scriptures can be extremely hurtful and oppressive. I understand, all right? I get it. I have a lot of compassion for anyone who was raised the way we have been in America where, you know, like if you've never heard these scriptures before, I understand like it, it throws a monkey wrench in everything you were taught and raised to believe. And while it's natural for you to turn your anger towards me, the person doing this video and wanting to hurt me or give me counsel, whatever, for calling your attention to the truth, because it's right here. I didn't write these scriptures. I encourage you to recognize that I did not write these scriptures. These are the words of God, right? So again, you have a choice. Just like I have a choice, right? I make I make this point in arguments to say, if the Bible instructed that husbands should submit to our wife's authority, I would obey it. If the Bible said that whoever makes the most money in a relationship is the one who makes the rules in a relationship, I would obey that. Not because that's what my wife or what mainstream media is pushing, but that's because that's what the Bible instructed. If that's what God instructed, that's not what God instructs. I encourage everyone to just pray, ask for God's guidance, ask for his help, right? It's not going to be, it's not going to happen overnight. This is baby steps, right? I just encourage you to calm down, calm down. Know that I'm not doing this to insult you, to belittle you, to beat you down. This is out of love, right? Because this is the path of salvation, right? The woman who said that she wanted to be a pastor in the documentary, she's a beautiful girl, right? She seems to have a good heart. I hope that she's still on her journey to be a Christian, which would lead her to those scriptures I just read. And I encourage her, I would encourage her by telling her that there's other ways you can serve and be a minister to others that don't involve preaching on Sunday from the pulpit, right? This picture is just a picture of a random Bible study. Women can do that. Women can lead those Bible groups. Women can lead one-on-one -on -one Bible studies. They can lead their, their Sunday schools, right? Right? I mean, there, there's plenty of use for women in the world. And so I don't want women to be discouraged and say, oh, you don't have a place or you need to show up. No, that's not what I'm saying. You know, but when it comes to being the pastor, the deacon, the one leading the church, it has to be a guy. And it's not sexist because a lot of men are disqualified from being pastors. In 1 Timothy chapter 3, it goes on to say that if anyone aspires to be an office of overseer or the pastor, he must be married to one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. That's what it says in chapter 3 of 1 Timothy. It says in verse 4 that the man must manage his own household well, with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? He must not be a recent convert, or he may be puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders, so that he may not fall into disgrace, into a snare of the devil. Hold up, Rock! What about rich pastors who seem to be lovers of money, right? And they do get drunk, and their children are a mess. They shouldn't be preaching, but they do, right? So if they can do that, what's the problem of letting a woman preach on Sunday? So your argument is, since other Christians aren't following the scriptures, I shouldn't have to either? 
because that's a huge indication of whether or not you've actively chosen to be a follower of Christ. The hypocrites will be dealt with, ladies and gentlemen, believe that. But what are you going to do? You're responsible for you. What are you going to do? Are you going to follow the herd off the bridge or are you going to take a stand to preserve your life? Now let's talk about homosexuality. I'm gonna again. I'm talking about uh, coming from a place of love. I know this is a sensitive issue, and I understand that it's it. I mean, a lot of people. I can get fired for this, you know. I I don't want to, but I I, I say this with love because I just want people to know the truth. I want people to be safe. When we, at the end, I'm gonna talk about my Titanic analogy, and that's really where I'm coming from. I have people in my life who. The thought of losing them eternally forever like this this world this life is just one aspect of it there's a life beyond this one if you choose to follow christ if you don't choose him and you die i'll never see you again i as i'm 36 all right i had someone die close to me at the beginning of this year and i worry if i'm gonna ever see her again because i don't think that she lived a very christian lifestyle that's a very real concern so when I talk about homosexuals, I have homosexual associates. I don't like to say the word friend because that word's important to me, but I have associates that I care about. I want them to be saved. Not to mention there are plenty of homosexuals who are Christian and they live with the knowledge of what the Bible says on the matter. And they're striving to do what's good in God's eyes, which means denying themselves denying themselves that's not fair rock well ladies and gentlemen that's what i do i'm a i'm a virgin right i believe in waiting to marriage because that's what the bible says so i deny myself i have ladies that i have the opportunity with but i deny myself because i put god first right that's what i'm coming from but rock that's not the same i get it it's, i know it's not the same i can't even begin to imagine what it's like to be be sexually inclined to the same sex i can't put myself in your shoes but I can't say that you do have a choice. Your inclination, your attraction to the opposite sex, you you may not have any control over that. I can't say one way or the other. But what you do with that attraction, that you do have control over. Just like I have control over not, you know, letting someone into my bedroom and having sex with her before marriage, you have the option, you have the control. You know, you have the choice as to whether or not you're going to act on your sexual urges. Okay? Let's get into it. On the issue of homosexuality in the church, a male prisoner in the documentary who happened to be gay, he talked about going to church because at first Hillsong seemed to embrace all progressive lifestyles. A lot of mega church seems to do that, you know, where they're having the, the band on stage, you know, it's a very welcoming, energetic place, and they seem to be welcoming and inviting to all. That's awesome. However, when pressed on the issue of whether Hillsong believed in gay marriage, Carl Lentz said that he believed that marriage was between a man and a woman, choosing to let the Bible speak for himself. And the gay parishioner, when he heard that, he wasn't happy with that stance. And again, I have to ask, why did you go to church? You know, did you come to have Christianity bend to your will or did you come to repent so you could be a Christian? It reminds me of a controversy recently that involving The Chosen. Um, for those who don't know, The Chosen is a very popular Christian miniseries about Jesus Christ's ministry on earth and I, like even this new church group that I just joined you know they're always raving about it I haven't seen it because I already saw something else that I'm like no nah, I'm not gonna I, I don't need to see it you know although I have nothing bad to say about it except this controversy that just came out recently it came out that a member of the production crew had a pride flag on display and apparently you know an official from the the chosen they defended having it on the set they said and I quote just like with hundreds of cast and crew who have different beliefs or no beliefs at all than we do, we will work with anyone on our show who helps us portray or honor the authentic Jesus. We ask that the audience let the show speak for itself and focus on the message, not the messenger, because we will always let you down. That sounds like an awesome response. Really, it does. But it doesn't really address the issue. The whole point about coming unto Christ is to repent from your former lifestyle. How can you promote that message while having a visual representation of the life we should be encouraging others to repent from? Let me repeat that. How can you promote that message of repenting from your former life while having a visual representation of the life that we should be encouraging others to repent from? That's a problem. It's the same as with going to a gay wedding. I get that you want to show that you still love the people involved. And some have even used the logic of, I want to show them that there's still room to come back to the fold. I get it. However, comparing attending a gay wedding to things that don't matter a ritual event that celebrates what God regards as egregious sin, where the participants actually vow to continue in the immorality lifelong, uh, that's no more a place for a Christian, faithful Christian, to be present at 
than it is for a faithful Christian to be present at an idol's temple. And I have a list of scriptures right up here on the screen. Check them out. So it's not like, oh, he's hating. I don't hate anyone. No, no true Christian hates anyone. We just want you to be saved. And, it, and that means telling you the truth about how God feels in the matter. Now, if you don't believe in God, if you don't believe in Jesus Christ, this video isn't for you, obviously, right? Of course, you're gonna find it super offensive because this is a belief system. This is faith. You know, believing that Jesus Christ existed is faith. If you don't, of course, you're gonna be upset. But if you are homosexual, if you are a Christian, look at the scriptures. I encourage you to talk to your pastor, talk to your friends, talk to people you trust who have to be Christian themselves and show them these scriptures and let them just ask them, ask them for help. What I'm seeing in these comments in the documentary from all these people who say things like, oh, well, Christianity, you know, is a step behind and, you know, Christianity is discrimination against women because they don't have female pastors or even the homosexual thing. What I'm seeing in these comments, it takes me back to my essay about arrogance, right? In my essay about arrogance, I talk about how I have the link down below for the video of it, but I talk about how, you know, when it comes, like I was called arrogant for most of my life. Oh, rock's always bragging, whatever. When it comes to the Bible scriptures, I'm not arrogant. I am very much humble. It took years for me to read the Bible, apply it to my life and to change my goals. I used to want to be one of the best selling authors ever, you know? And when I read the Bible, I found that it's not, that's not important. That's not why I exist. You know, like that God should come first. Back then it was publishing that come, came first. So I had to change who I was to conform to Christ's teachings, okay? As much as the documentary was supposed to be an expose on the corruption of Hillsong, almost every person given the interview, except with the exception of Carl Lentz's wife, Laura, they revealed themselves to be very much the opposite of humble, right? These are a group of individuals who believe that they know better than God. Hang on, Rock. I see so much criticism for homosexuality, but I didn't see nearly as much criticism about Carl Lentz and his adultery or cheating on his wife because in the documentary, guess what? He repented. He showed contrition. He didn't boast or brag about cheating on his wife or say it was cool and acceptable. He didn't have pride for his sins that he committed. You could tell he deeply regretted what he did. He doesn't want to do it again. That's repentance. Now, if the people in the video, the other people showed that same level of contrition saying, you know, I shouldn't have these, these thoughts about, you know, homosexual or I shouldn't have these thoughts about wanting to be a pastor. I should humble myself. Maybe I would be singing a different tune. That's not what they're doing. The, the documentary basically with those statements, they wanted to criticize Christianity as a Christianity, as if Christianity is wrong for having standards, having rules, having roles for men and women. Ladies and gentlemen, I, get, I encourage you to beware of progressive ideologies. Anything that moves away from God, what God teaches, beware of it. This is why you have to read the Bible so you can learn for yourself. I know a, a church member recently, and I didn't want to interject because it's between a man and woman, a, a husband and a wife, and like the wife wants to read the entire Bible, but the husband said, no, you know, we should just stick to you know the Bible studies with the congregation because we have, already have enough on our plate. And I've told, I, I wanted to tell him, bro, no. You should definitely read what's in the Bible first because people can manipulate and twist whatever you want. Christianity is open and accepting of everyone, but contrary to modern opinion, there are conditions to salvation. I like to use the library analogy here. The library is free and open to everyone, right? However, there's a sign on the door. You need to wear a shirt and shoes to enter. Similarly, salvation through Christ is open and freely given to everyone. However, you need to repent. The, the condition, the sign on the door for salvation is repent and believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Part of believing is accepting the instructions and commands given in the Bible. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9-11 through 11 clearly explains that behaviors such as sexual immorality, homosexuality, adultery will have no place in the kingdom of heaven. This doesn't mean that God doesn't love people who committed these sins. Think of a loving parent who finds out that his son just robbed the bank. That parent still loves their son, but they're probably very, very disappointed and that son is probably going to jail right? There's consequences to your actions that you're hot to face. Doesn't mean that people don't love you. And I get it. Reading the Bible can be a bit scary because once you read it, exactly how God feels in the issue, especially if it's behavior that you actively indulge, celebrate, and condone, now you have no excuse. You can't claim ignorance and say, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know. I never knew. I'm not dismissive of that fear, okay? Jesus Christ himself described these kind of people who will fall away due to the pressures of the world in this parable of the sower. I have that link down below. And while I do hope that God will show mercy to those who lack the courage, you have to understand that God has witnessed humanity from his very first creation. If you're afraid, if you're afraid to learn the truth, chances are it's because you already know in your heart that you're living a sinful lifestyle. Meaning, 
If you don't want to pick up the Bible and read what Jesus Christ and God says on the matter, it's probably because you already know what you're doing is wrong. Ladies and gentlemen, in chap John chapter 3, Jesus Christ described this as darkness. He says that people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. Again, contrary to pop opinion about us Christians, we do love you. Not your sin, not your worldly behavior, not your culture or the wickedness you embrace. We love the fact that you're alive, that you have a soul that's worth saving. Okay, this brings me to my Titanic analogy and I'll wrap it up. In my Titanic analogy, it's like if we're all told that, that Titanic is going to go down. And the only way to get on those lifeboats is if you believe in Jesus Christ and repent. But so many years have passed, right? The Titanic hasn't sunk. They're calling it the unsinkable. So they don't believe anymore. They don't believe in Jesus Christ. They don't believe in being, you know, believing in him and repenting in order to get a life. But because the Titanic's not going to sink. That's what they start to think. Wicked people, they influence the masses and encourage them to forget all about Jesus Christ and all of his boring rules. Look at all this fun. Look at all this, you know, dancing around in steerage. So many are enticed to indulge in their wickedness with their, you know, de not deny themselves. Why are you denying yourself? You really want this? You want that in your heart? Your weakness of your flesh? Go for it. Then boom, the Titanic has struck an iceberg and starting to sink. Those of us who maintain our faith and repent it and believe in Jesus, we're safe on those lifeboats. However, some of our loved ones, our friends and family are still on the Titanic. It brings us no joy to see that we're safe while so many of them are going down on this satanic ship. Oh, this is why I do what I do. This is why I'm doing this video. This is why I wrote this essay. That's why it makes me so mad when I see all the wicked influence turning people away. Whether it's social media, Instagram, all these influencers, people just spitting nonsense, racking up thousands of views and hundreds of millions of likes and stuff like that. It just makes me upset because it's like, I wish I was cool. I wish I looked like a celebrity. I wish I could sing and dance, twirl on stage, you know, and then spit out the gospels so I can influence a wider mass audience. I don't have that ability. It's sad to say, it does go to a point where you kind of want to leave people alone because it hurts knowing that they've chosen the temporary pleasures of this world over eternal life. My friends, again, I encourage you to pray for a humble heart, submit yourself to the words of God, and ask Him to push out all these wicked ideologies that the world's impressed upon you. It won't be easy. It won't happen overnight. But if you pray and ask God to mold you, to work on your heart and soul, I know He won't deny you. I know this because He does love you. He wants you to be saved. That's what I had about the documentary Hillsong. Um, I, again, this was, wasn't planned. I just saw the documentary with the open mind, open heart, and I just saw a lot of, oh man, it was just, it was disheartening to see so many people who claim to be Christians and parishioners, and they have this very modern progressive ideology that just conflicts with the Bible, you know? And, you know, maybe God will forgive them. Maybe God will understand and say, oh, well, that's, that's all right, you know? You were twisted and lied to by modern opinion, so it, it makes sense why, you know, you believe that, you know, a female could be a pastor, and I don't know, I I hope he has mercy on those people. I really do. All right, ladies and gentlemen, let me know what you think. Thank you guys for watching. If you're on my if you're on my website, Stage in the Sky, I thank you for, um, I thank you for reading. All right, till next time.